Hello, and this is uh, Jan Lehmans from Oracle. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I know a colleague of mine is on the line, so I thought if you can confirm that everything is green on your side. Everything is fine. Hello, everybody. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So let's get started. So uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on cloud native application development from development to production. Uh, my name is Jan Lehmans. I'm a business development director in the uh, Oracle EMEA cloud native uh, team, and I'm specifically focusing on our cloud uh, application development platforms. Uh, today, we will talk about the cloud native uh, space uh, where Oracle has made some uh, uh, pretty big uh, advances and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you will get a better view on that uh, after uh, this webinar. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat and at the end we will open up for Q&A uh, answering the questions uh, that you've posed uh, in the chat and maybe even interactively. Uh, I'm actually new to this platform so we will discover that together. Uh, so with that, uh, let me get started. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Um, you should see my cloud native. Yes, I will talk about a few new products that are not yet released. Uh, so in that case, the safe harbor statement uh, applies. Uh, please do not base any buying decisions on future product announcements. But without further ado, let's dive into the topic of application development. There's been uh, a big evolution uh, in the industry. We moved from uh, waterfall monolithic applications in uh, data centers at customers to a hired model uh, using virtualization and agile methodologies to now DevOps or even DevSecOps and microservices, containers and cloud. Cloud has really changed the game and Oracle is uh, making that move uh, along with you, along with our customers, and offering you choice and options to move from that on-premise world to the cloud, to move from those monolithic applications that a lot of customers are still running, to microservices and containers, and all the cloud, the good cloud native and open source stuff in the cloud. And that is basically uh, what we're gonna talk about uh, here. And we use the term, cloud native uh, uh, a lot. So basically, what do we mean with it? It's uh, the ability to run uh, uh, modular, small-scale applications in a very agile way using smaller teams, you being able to scale up and scale down real fast to use any language that you prefer and any uh, framework that you prefer and run that in open source environments. And the key uh, uh, examples of that technology are basically uh, containers, Docker containers and Kubernetes, and functions. And these are the key uh, technologies that we will leverage and uh, build upon to deploy uh, a, a much richer set of features that is based on top of that platform. So Docker as the basis, Kubernetes as the orchestration framework to run those types of applications, and then serverless applications and FN project, uh, an open source project uh, uh, let by Oracle uh, in particular, uh, together with a bunch of open, other open source uh, technologies that we either um, embedded in our platform or new open source uh, projects that we launched uh, from Oracle uh, itself. Now, some say cloud native is bus. Uh, uh, that might have been true like three four, or four years ago. But if we look at uh, this uh, uh, survey from uh, the CNCF Foundation, uh, we see that we moved from 23% of the organizations running cloud native in production to 84, which is significant. Uh, more than that, it's not only uh, a large proportion of customers running that type of applications, it's also large scale deployments that are happening. If you look on the chart on the right, you see that more than half of them have more than 100 machines actually under this type of uh, technology. Uh, running. So it is very significant and uh, Oracle is making great strides to have an offering in that space. Why should you look at Oracle for this? Well, basically we have a, a nice end-to-end -end cloud native and DevOps integrated platform to deploy any application on. On top of that, with our history in the on-premise world, we have a, a, a rich history of data management. Uh, I think we can say that we have the richest, richest offering in terms of 
data persistency databases and uh, a lot of those on-premise applications today are actually running on Oracle and so it is very easy to lift and shift them and reap the benefits of that cloud native world by uh, running on uh, uh, Oracle. And then on top of that we are now on what we call our Gen 2 second generation infrastructure which has real uh, performance per dollar uh, cost uh, benefits. So from a cost perspective and from a management perspective, we offer vanilla open source standard uh, industry standard frameworks like Kubernetes, but in a managed uh, way at a very, very uh, uh, competitive cost. So all in all, a very compelling platform to run your applications on, both your existing applications on premise, lift and shift them over to Oracle, and then deploy your cloud native applications on that infrastructure uh, because it's vanilla open source, you can run anything, obviously, on that. And I think this diagram uh, nicely uh, summarizes uh, the offering uh, that we have. We'll go into more detail as we go along. But basically, uh, we have the uh, cloud infrastructure layer, which I won't go too much into detail in, but basically compute, storage, networking, and obviously security uh, as a given, uh, uh, spinning up these resources in a completely virtual way. But on top of that, we have a rich set of uh, services, uh, the cloud native being at the core of it with uh, Kubernetes and functions and uh, a, a bunch of other services, allowing you to basically run any language and any framework uh, that you are developing in that uh, cloud native uh, uh, fashion. Along with, and I will detail that also, your existing applications that you can also run on that platform. So lift and shift your existing monoliths to uh, the cloud native environment and make them cohabitate with those cloud native services. For that, we offer a number of tools, uh, developer tools on the left. Uh, Oracle uh, uh, incorporated a few of them in the platform itself, but we're open to any of the industry uh, flavors there. The data management aspect, of course, I will go into a little bit more detail there. And then uh, the rich set of typical DevOps uh, uh, environments uh, that you can use. Uh, we have a bunch of them built in, and I will demo, hopefully I'll have time enough to build, to, to demo the Visual Builder tool, uh, tool set uh, that we have, and a number of other elements, like for example, Resource Manager, uh, which I will detail later, is a, a Terraform implementation uh, that you get out of the box there. So a rich set of features, and uh, as I said, uh, we are really shifting from uh, proprietary software to open source. We are uh, bringing industry standard open source to uh, uh, the, the cloud by running it as managed services. Uh, we participate, for example, for Kubernetes in the uh, CNCF uh, foundation. If we want to make a change, we submit it and we implement the vanilla CNCF uh, version of uh, Kubernetes. But we also bring our own uh, um, open source projects to uh, the community and then we run them as managed services at the fee obviously but uh, taking away the burden of actually running uh, those platforms and i will uh, detail that uh, as we go along uh, in uh, the presentation so uh, without further ado uh, let's dive into a little bit more detail uh, let's look at these cloud native components i already mentioned that we have uh, kubernetes obviously uh, uh, managed servers that allows you to spin that up in no time and take uh, benefit of that uh, immediately without having to worry about the underlying infrastructure combined with that we have a private registry that allows you to deploy your containers close to the location where uh, the actual application will be running on uh, that Kubernetes platform. And then a whole set of other services like functions, allowing you to just develop a piece of code and throw it on, a, on, the, on the cloud as a function, streaming, uh, uh, an Apache Kafka-like uh, data flow service, uh, events to respond to infrastructure changes, for example, new files or events happening within your infrastructure or within your application landscape to respond to that, for example, with a function or uh, with a, a microservice. And then API management, obviously, if you want to open up your environments to the outside world, 
especially if you want to open up your APIs to the outside world, you need a defense barrier there. You need to define policies and throttling and what have you to make sure that that happens in an enterprise grade way. So we're a rich set of toolings that you can use uh, uh, to, to build and run your applications uh, in that space. Now, if you look at the actual DevOps cycle, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I hope I'll have time to give you a quick uh, demo of Visual Builder Studio, which is our uh, CI/CD environment that allows you to have, for example, a Git repository and set up automated pipelines to deploy software to build Docker images and to deploy them on Kubernetes, for example. But there's much more. There's a compatibility with uh, Prometheus, Grafana, uh, notifications, logging, uh, and then Resource Manager, which is basically, uh, again, an open source platform, uh, an open source uh, project, uh, Terraform, that we offer as a managed service on the platform itself. And I will go uh, later in a little bit more detail on that uh, uh, topic too. Now, obviously, the database is pretty important at Oracle. Uh, we are uh, much more than the database, but Obviously, when you develop cloud native applications, you need to store uh, that data in some way. And Oracle is offering a very rich set of ways to set up those databases. Uh, you can do that in the cloud in a way that is customer managed, whereby you have full control over that database. You install a database basically that is uh, uh, an exact copy of a database that you would have had on-premise, so there is no change to uh, your application whatsoever. Or you can leverage our autonomous uh, offering, which is basically a database that is uh, most of the part managed by Oracle. Uh, you just have to worry about your data, inserting it, extracting it, etc. Et the whole patching, updating, upgrading uh, of that database itself is managed by Oracle. So that's at the other end of the spectrum whereby Oracle takes a big chunk of running that database and you as a developer just worry about creating a table, uh, putting data in it and using that uh, environment in your uh, development uh, life cycle without having to worry about the low level uh, database aspects of that. Obviously, security again is very important. Security is baked into the Oracle Cloud infrastructure itself. And on top of that, you can leverage all the security mechanisms that are built in uh, over, have been built in over all these years in uh, the Oracle database uh, to secure your data on a, a number of levels, uh, uh, albeit uh, with data masking, with uh, advanced security on the level of who can see what, etc. Uh, so a very uh, rich set of offerings that you can use to store your data. On the development lifecycle, as I mentioned, we are basically running on Kubernetes uh, mainly, uh, deploying any application as a Docker container. So that means that it, this is a true polyglot platform. You can use any language and on top of that language, any framework. Obviously, we are, uh, historically, uh, we have been focusing a lot on Java. Uh, so we have a very strong Java offering, uh, but we are definitely enriching that uh, right now. Uh, I will uh, talk about a few examples where we have uh, Node as a, uh, base language uh, to develop, for example, Visual Builder. Uh, uh, the rapid development environment is not based on Java, it's based on uh, JavaScript. Uh, so uh, uh, we are definitely extending that. We are supporting all these languages with SDKs and what have you. And we are bringing open source elements to that mix, like Helidon. Uh, I have a slide on that uh, more in detail, but Helidon is basically a uh, a Java microservices framework uh, that allows you to have uh, uh, low weight uh, applications that spin up real fast. And then we have Graal. Graal VM is basically a, a replacement of the Java VM, uh, but it is one polyglot. It compiles Java, but also uh, scripting language, languages, most of the languages that are on this slide, by the way. And it's fast. It's really fast. It's uh, allowing you to have spectacular startup times and also to have uh, runtime improvements, so the uh, compiler optimizations make that it is like 10 to 20% faster than uh, the standard Java uh, VM uh, that you would use today. So these are all open source projects, which are also available in our cloud in a more or less managed way. Because for Graal, for example, there's no managed version of it. It's like 
something that you plug underneath uh, your applications. Uh, if we look at the developer tools, so there's a, a bunch of tools that are included in the cloud. The most recent one is our Cloud Shell, which is a very tool to interact with your cloud environment, really. So uh, a single uh, location to go, your cloud console, uh, where you have all your services up and running. I'll demo that in a while. And with the cloud console, you can very easily uh, issue commands. You have a full-fledged developer environment with Git, uh, uh, Docker, uh, Functions, uh, Terraform, all these components are pre-installed in that Cloud Shell and that allows, that gives you a lot of uh, productivity to, to interact with that uh, environment. At the same time, all the, I would say, industry standard open source ways to develop are, uh, are, are open uh, uh, to this platform. You can deploy and use any of the toolings that are here on the left to deploy and interact with the platform. Uh, as we have APIs, CLIs, uh, uh, REST uh, APIs uh, to interact uh, with it. We support Terraform, we, do, we support Ansible. So you can in interact with uh, all the cloud services in a variety of ways that is fully industry uh, compatible. Uh, now, another aspect I mentioned already, the database in terms of management, uh, in, the, in terms of uh, the database as with respect to microservices. Uh, there's an ad additional benefit is that you can use the uh, autonomous database as a one-stop fits all uh, type of database. In a typical microservices architecture you have specialized databases but that uh, uh, brings an overhead of different technologies that you have to uh, incorporate. With the Oracle database you can actually have all these types of uh, databases in one single instance. You can have JSON types, you have key value, you have uh, relational databases, of course, uh, but also other types of uh, interactions with the database uh, that is uh, all in a single uh, management structure, very easy uh, for you to uh, develop and maintain uh, those applications uh, along the way. So with that, I think I've uh, spoken a lot uh, on slide. Let's uh, take a little bit of time to show you some stuff. I'm going to go out of my presentation mode and I will go into my browser. So if somebody from the crew can confirm that you can see this browser window correctly. Yes. Okay, so I'm logging into, I have a shortcut straight into my environment. Obviously I have to log in, but I think I already logged in previously. No, I rebooted my PC. So I have to re-log in, here we go. So this is the Cloud Console, uh, not spectacular, I will say, but uh, a very rich environment in, in, uh, to be true. Uh, some quick actions that you can do, like creating a VM, uh, setting up a network, uh, uh, creating a database, and a rich set of manuals and tutorials uh, to get started. Uh, an overview of uh, what has happened, uh, what uh, is the billing situation of your account, but most important is a little icon here on the left, this is basically where you manage all the services. So if you fold that out, you see the different chapters here, and I hope it's too small. Uh, you can see the core infrastructure services. Uh, that, that's this menu with compute, uh, storage, uh, and networking. It's, this is base infrastructure stuff. You spin up a VM, you choose your shape, you choose uh, uh, all the parameters, and you get, uh, in no time, you have an up and running uh, machine. Uh, nothing's spectacular there. What is nice is that all the services on top of the, the, that infrastructure are in that same menu underneath it. So here you have all the database options that you can spin up. And so for example, the autonomous database that I mentioned is here and it's just a simple wizard if you go into that menu to spin up a database. So I'm here in my compartment. I have two databases that are available. I want to create a new database. Well, I have a very simple wizard that allows me to specify a few parameters uh, specify how much compute power I actually want to add uh, to that machine, specify uh, a username and password, and off you go. That's it. My database will be created in a few minutes. I'm not going to do that in the interest of time, uh, but the same is true for the other services. So the, the second one that I want to highlight is the uh, developer services. And if we go to the developer services, this is where we can spin up very easily a uh, Kubernetes cluster. 
So this is uh, my environment here. You see there's a bunch of them uh, up and running. Uh, again, a very simple wizard, create cluster. There's the quick create, very simple way to create a new Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I go into my workflow. I have to choose a name. I can choose a version, uh, private public. I can choose a shape of the compute nodes that are underneath that uh, environment. And then uh, that's about it uh, for the simple wizard. There's a more complex wizard where you can do much more uh, configuration, fine tuning of which network interfaces to use, which security level, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is the quick uh, start wizard. You hit next and off you go, uh, you're finished. Uh, again, in the, in the interest of time, I won't do it, but that is a very simple way uh, to see what is up and running. Uh, here, you, I, for example, I can go into an existing cluster. I can see some uh, metrics uh, that are there, and I can go to my node pools, and I can see what type of infrastructure is underneath that. Uh, this is a very simple one that I use for some testing. It's actually a very old one on an old version. I should upgrade it soon. Uh, and that is actually just a button away, right? Uh, um, the node pools is uh, uh, where the actual applications will be deployed will be deployed, and that is, in this case, just a single node, but that can be a very a much more complex uh, node. So with that, I think you've seen uh, a first introduction of the services. Uh, there's all the other services that I haven't mentioned yet, resource manager, the application integration space, monitoring with metering and alarms, uh, etc. Uh, we will go through a few more of them uh, in the PPT, and then I will do a second uh, set of demos. So with that, let me get back into my PowerPoint. Uh, what am I doing with time? Okay, let's get in the presentation mode again. So I'll highlight a few of the services. Uh, one of them we already looked at, which is the uh, Kubernetes cluster, uh, the managed Kubernetes cluster. So basically, it's an enterprise-grade uh, environment to run your uh, 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 see, container workloads. It's uh, fully managed by Oracle, uh, as you will see in the, in the next slide. It's fully uh, open source based. It's uh, not a Oracle flavor of this uh, uh, of, the, of, of Kubernetes or anything. Uh, it does integrate a private registry, which is just on the side of it. I should have shown you that uh, in the demo. I can do that in my second uh, part of the demo. And basically, it allows you to very quickly spin up uh, this uh, this environment. It's available in all our regions, and the number of regions that we have, the number of data centers around the world that we have, is increasing uh, quite spectacularly over uh, these last months. And uh, with a very, uh, I would say, ambitious roadmap ahead of us of new data centers opening a little bit all over the place. Uh, so check your the nearest data center and you will see uh, uh, that uh, I don't have a slide on that right now. Let's say at uh, the Kubernetes level, so basically what we're doing is uh, for you running the control plane of that uh, Kubernetes engine, uh, we run the management node and you do not have to pay for that. Uh, this is all managed by Oracle. The same is true for the registry. Uh, as long as you don't uh, uh, store excessive volumes of data, this is completely free from a usage perspective, and you do not need to worry at all uh, about the underlying infrastructure. You just have a, 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 a Docker v2 compliant registry, you deploy your, uh, you store your containers there, and you can use it uh, to deploy to your worker nodes. And that is actually uh, what you will be paying for, is the workload of CPU uh, that you are running in your uh, worker nodes, and that is where you will have access to. You can uh, access these nodes and you can uh, deploy applications on them in the usual way. You have a rich set of choice in terms of underlying types of hardware. Uh, can be bare metal with as, much, as many as 128 uh, cores or a single uh, core uh, virtual machine uh, and everything in between. So uh, full flexibility there. Uh, what I didn't mention yet is that we have three availability domains in most uh, data center regions, which means that when you set up a cluster with three nodes, that cluster will actually be distributed across those three availability domains, which are three separate data centers in that same uh, uh, area. So uh, data center I most often use is Frankfurt. Uh, 
there's three separate data centers and uh, when you deploy a new Kubernetes cluster uh, with three nodes, it will deploy uh, one on each of those uh, data centers uh, in a very automated way. It's completely transparent uh, to you, uh, basically. So a typical flow is, well, you have all your CI CD tools. Uh, I will present a few of them uh, that we can offer uh, later, but it can be anything that you're using today. It can be GitLab, uh, uh, Jenkins, what have you. Uh, you, push your, you build your container, you push it to the registry, you then push your, uh, your, uh, your uh, deployment to your, you define your uh, deployment on your Kubernetes cluster, which will pull uh, the image from the registry, and then your, your application is basically uh, up and running, and uh, yeah, you can expose those services, uh, potentially using all those other services like uh, load balancers and gateways and what have you, uh, to make sure that this application is uh, accessible in uh, the appropriate way uh, to your uh, external or potentially external uh, audience. So, for, so far uh, for the containers. Um, the other aspect I want to highlight uh, today is the Oracle functions. So this is a serverless infrastructure. It's functions as a service. Well, this is actually an open source project. You can go to fnproject.io. Uh, anybody can contribute. It's an open source project. You can download it, you can run it. But obviously, when you want to set up a serverless environment, actually there are servers somewhere and somebody has to run them. So if you deep download the open source, you are in charge of running that platform that your developers will deploy their functions to. What Oracle is offering with Oracle Functions is a managed uh, service of that open source service. It's all based on containers. So you basically deploy a container and the platform will spin up that container when a call for that function comes in. If no second call comes in after a certain time, there's a timeout, that container will be uh, unmounted and nothing will run again on uh, that server. So basically you will pay per use, per call to that uh, platform, which is a very, very small fee actually per call. Uh, and then you do not have to worry about that underlying platform at all. And as it is open source, there is no lock-in at all. If tomorrow you decide you want to run this same uh, environment on-premise or with another cloud vendor, you can perfectly well do that. Uh, it is uh, in all aspects uh, open source. So in summary, how does it work? You push your function image to the registry as a Docker image. You configure your function uh, on the level of the interface of the uh, uh, managed uh, the uh, Oracle Functions platform, and then that's where it ends if nobody calls the function, right? So uh, when somebody calls in the function, the function platform will make sure to spin up the container, execute the function, respond uh, with the answer, and then potentially go down again. And at the end, you're built by uh, the call to that platform. So as I said, it's all based on containers. Uh, uh, it's all based on open source library. You can package any open source library. We have a number of SDKs that you can leverage that make it a little bit more easy to develop your applications. Uh, but basically, um, you could run anything uh, that is uh, deployable as a Docker container on top of this platform. When would you use this? Well, typically for, for example, event-driven uh, things. If, if something happens, somebody puts an order in, somebody does something on a specific system, you can trigger an activity that will spin up a function, do what it needs to do, and then uh, go away again. Can be used both uh, through web interfaces, through mobile, can be used uh, uh, as a, a, a kind of a backend service, uh, can also be used to do uh, real-time uh, uh, processing of files, and there are uh, potential to use, for example, with machine learning, uh, and in the DevOps cycle itself, uh, you can build in these types of, of elements. Now, talking about uh, the whole cycle, uh, um, let me also introduce Resource Manager. So, Resource Manager allows you to uh, manage your infrastructure as code. Resource Manager is a, an implementation of Terraform. Terraform is a uh, open source framework uh, developed by HashiCorp that allows you to basically configure your cloud infrastructure for a specific project in a very structured way, in a very easy way, that doesn't force you to take into account all the dependencies between the different infrastructure elements. You just define them, 
and the platform, uh, the, the framework itself will figure out what is the correct order to spin up that environment. And uh, if you change the configuration file, the uh, platform will actually try to get to that new state based on the existing state. And that is where uh, the fact that you uh, package Terraform as a managed service comes in very good because in a traditional situation, what you do is when you run Terraform just on your PC to spin up an environment, you get those state files on your PC, which is not very good in a corporate environment when you have teams that needs, need to be able to manage uh, that type of uh, uh, deployment. You want to store those configuration files, sorry, those state files in a specific way. And so again, uh, using a cloud service that basically uh, offers Terraform is a very easy way to share that across uh, your team to apply governance on it and again it's uh, basically a free service you pay uh, when you spin up infrastructure obviously when you spin up a database or a compute instance or a kubernetes cluster you pay for the paying resources of that the service itself is uh, offered on top of the platform so i have a, a slide that details this a little bit so you can do plan apply and destroy like you would uh, on the command line of your terraform script and then uh, you have jobs uh, that you spin up. Uh, you can uh, visualize the stack, you can uh, edit the stack uh, that you defined. Um, and you can even introspect an existing uh, configuration that is out there and create a Terraform script out of that to use that as a starting point. So you don't have to uh, start from scratch after you've done some testing and some building up of, of an environment. You can simply introspect that environment and use that to replicate it in a second environment, for example, uh, from test to dev to prod, etc., uh, and and as such, uh, use that as a piece of code and submit that in uh, your versionings. So that basically sums up a resource manager. A third service that I would like to uh, uh, go a little bit deeper on is uh, Visual Builder Studio. Now, this is our DevOps environment that allows you basically to manage the whole cycle of developing code, packaging the code, and deploying it to uh, an environment. Um, it, it contains a Git repository, it contains build pipelines, uh, but it also does the management of your team. It has uh, um, issue management, it has um, uh, agile uh, uh, boards and, and uh, um, release management, etc., all in one single tool. Uh, now, I can talk about this, but I think it's it's much nicer if I show this uh, to you live. So uh, I'll do that after uh, a few more slides on a few references that I wanted to highlight, some of the customers that have been running uh, on this platform. The first one is uh, Snaptech. This is a company that uh, delivers uh, uh, visual services, basically the, uh, the, the ability to take uh, uh, images and use them in uh, a context of... Uh, uh, marketing so they moved into uh, uh, our cloud native services uh, using for example our uh, graphic uh, gpu uh, shapes to uh, accelerate tremendously uh, the the speed and the power of their uh, solution so some some impressive numbers uh, on this case um, deployment times much faster uh, a, a, a decrease in management overhead as specifically uh, with respect to uh, the data uh, storage and then uh, yeah in general a reduction of the administrative tasks uh, surrounding uh, that solution uh, that combined with a uh, real good uh, uptime uh, basically a hundred percent uptime uh, uh, so far uh, for this uh, environment Another customer is AgroScout. They uh, are using drones to do crop uh, inspection. And they also migrated uh, to this platform. They used Kubernetes, and uh, in this case, not the Oracle database, but the SQL database on top of the cloud platform. Uh, you might have noticed that we have multiple flavors of uh, the database. Obviously, the Oracle database is available in different management levels. There is also SQL, MySQL, uh, NoSQL, etc. So there's a bunch of databases database flavors that you can run as a managed service on top of the platform, independent of the fact that obviously you can deploy any open source database on top of the infrastructure, right? So there's no uh, uh, 
I would say, obligation to, to, to run the Oracle database, although we strongly suggest it if you want to have some enterprise-grade uh, performance. Uh, this customer, again, uh, implementing a, a full uh, DevOps solution on top of this, uh, looking at a serious uh, performance improvement and uh, increase of the uh, developer velocity as compared with their old solution. Now, another element that I mentioned in the beginning is the, uh, the fact that a lot of organizations have existing applications. They're not all developing applications from scratch. Uh, there's a lot of existing, what I would call monolith uh, services, so big uh, old style layered services out there, and they're not gonna go away anytime soon. Most organizations are not uh, ready to refactor these applications uh, uh, from A to Z uh, into a cloud native uh, infrastructure. So what can we offer uh, to those customers? Well, basically, as I mentioned, we offer the ability to lift and shift those applications as is into a cloud native environment, taking them uh, uh, taking those applications running on WebLogic and offering the WebLogic environment as a container uh, on top of our Kubernetes platform. So we developed an environment that allows you to very easily lift and shift those applications as is using the exact same technology as you would in the past on-premise, but then in that cloud uh, native environment. And on the level of the project management team that is managing this environment, we now cover not only the web logic and, and coherence. Coherence is a memory grid uh, that has been around uh, a long time uh, alongside uh, web logic. So you can lift web logic and coherence to the cloud, but I would call them more uh, existing on prem technologies. Alongside that, we are also uh, introducing Helidon. Helidon is a Java library framework for microservices. And I do have a slide uh, with more detail on Helidon uh, just after this. Uh, uh, on top of this, we have Verrazano. And Verrazano is a application management tool, which actually is not yet out. So this is uh, why I had to include a safe harbor statement. It will be released in the near future. I can't be more specific, unfortunately, but uh, Verrazano will offer the ability to deploy both monolithic applications running on WebLogic, as well as microservice applications running in a Helidon or a Docker uh, environment on top of uh, Kubernetes. So combining this monolithic old style world with the uh, uh, new cloud native microservices style in one deployment mechanism is already good. What's even better is that Verrazano also uh, covers multiple environments so it can cover both on-premise as well as clouds, clouds as in plural, obviously the Oracle Cloud, but also uh, any other cloud where Kubernetes resources are available where you could deploy uh, these applications. So really a way to bridge uh, that gap between the old world and that new uh, cloud native world. Quickly going over the, the features that have been added to WebLogic to, to enable this, basically uh, make it ready to run in the cloud, make it open uh, for DevOps, leverage Kubernetes to offer new models of high availability, and make sure that the manageability of the environment is fully compatible with uh, existing uh, open source, uh, or I would say cloud native uh, type of uh, uh, environments like uh, using uh, Grafana, etc., uh, uh, for logging and tracing, uh, using those same mechanisms, making the output of WebLogic compatible with that type of environment. And then the ability to run both on premise and in the cloud uh, on top of Kubernetes. I have one more slide uh, on this. So basically, the details of uh, running WebLogic on Kubernetes is done through the Operators. An operator is a normal mechanism in Kubernetes to uh, deploy non-standard uh, uh, environments uh, on top of that. So it's a, the operator will actually be in charge of spinning up the container that contains uh, WebLogic using your traditional deployment files as you uh, would uh, for any other uh, application. Uh, in the interest of time, because I do want to do a quick demo still, I'll speed up a little bit. 
there is more here. We can go into more detail. If you are interested, contact us. We do have a imaging tool that allows you to uh, design yourself the building of the Docker image that contains uh, the WebLogic. There is a uh, migration tooling that allows you to very easily transpose a existing on-prem environment to the cloud, etc. But I won't go any further uh, with that. Uh, one last slide before the demo. Um, hmm, actually, two. Uh, Helidon. So Helidon is our Java uh, open source framework uh, for microservices. Uh, it is an open source, so you can just download it and run it. Uh, we do offer support for WebLogic paying customers, uh, and it's available in two flavors. So there is the SE flavors, uh, which is a, a declarative style of programming, uh, sorry, a, a functional style of programming, and others. Uh, and there is the NP, which is uh, micro profile uh, compatible, which is an industry standard. Uh, uh, and you can position it basically uh, as opposed to the other uh, microservice frameworks uh, in, in, in this. So it's, it's micro, Helidon SE is really, really very light. It's actually a micro framework. Uh, Helidon MP is a fully compatible framework with uh, micro profile. So it offers Java EE type of programming. And then, well, if you compare it to Spring Boot, Spring Boot is, 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 is actually uh, uh, quite a lot heavier. And I think that's the main differentiator. Uh, Headed on MP is much more agile and, and lightweight uh, with respect uh, to that. I did mention GraalVM already, so uh, maybe I don't have to spend too much time on this. This is really uh, uh, an alternative way of uh, uh, running your applications. It makes Java faster, a lot faster, in startup time and in uh, execution time. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, you can. Uh, it is compatible with existing software like uh, uh, Web, WebLogic and uh, Coherence, and uh, it allows you to basically also run other languages, uh, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, etc. There's interoperability uh, between these languages uh, on uh, the level of uh, the execution. Now let's do a quick uh, demo. Um, what I have set up, and uh, I'll point you to the lab, to the location where you can see that lab. I think it's if you want to get a first feel of what it uh, means to develop in this environment, you can follow that lab. Uh, uh, I've set up a developer cloud environment, uh, which we actually renamed. My slide is outdated. This is now called uh, Visual Builder Studio. Apologies for that. Uh, it's a drawing, so I need to redo my drawing. Uh, I use Visual Builder Studio to deploy uh, SQL to the database. I use Terraform to actually spin up the infrastructure components, the database itself and the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And I use uh, the build pipelines uh, to uh, package a node application into a container and then deploy that container on uh, uh, the, the Kubernetes platform. So that's the lab. Let me show you how you get there. I'm going to go out of presentation mode now, go back to my browser. Let me go to my other window. So yeah, this is the uh, uh, Oracle GitHub uh, uh, location. So github.com, Oracle, and then uh, the keyword to remember is cloud test drive. So this is public information. And the lab that I'm going to very quickly uh, describe you is actually uh, this link here below. Um, microservices using autonomous ATP and managed containers. If you go to that lab, you can see there's a full explanation, step-by-step step of how to execute those steps that I just uh, detailed. So first of all, we're gonna prepare your tenancy. Well, actually first you need to get a tenancy, right? So you need to get, you need to get a hold of a tenancy. For that, you can just go to uh, our free tire. You will get uh, uh, access to that uh, and you will get uh, uh, credit uh, for one month to run that. Once you have that, you can prepare your tenancy and you can, uh, uh, start executing uh, the last steps. So let me very quickly show you. Etere, can I still have five minutes before the Q and A? Uh, can you please advise on uh, the best way? Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, I think it's relevant to show the demo part. Okay. And there are uh, a couple of questions that I selected for you, and uh, you have in chat. I sent to you. Okay. So. I showed you the cloud platform. Now uh, I'm going to go straight into the developer uh, part of that platform. 
I have a link straight into that, so I'm opening a new window. And this is my development environment. Uh, what I can do is spin up a new project, uh, define who will work on that project, and uh, what that does is uh, give me, and I will open this project actually to show you that. Uh, this is just a, a little project that I use to, uh, to show this sort of environment. This uh, gives me a Git repository where I basically, in this case, uh, for the lab, uh, what I do is I just uh, 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 upload a Git uh, repository into this, uh, a GitHub repository into this one, starter uh, repository, and then we start working on it, uh, creating the YAML files for the for the deployments, creating everything that is necessary. Um, so here you have a standard Git. Uh, you can do all the things. You can manage your requests, your merge requests, uh, push pull. Uh, you have your uh, uh, issue uh, management, so you can log what has happened with uh, 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 issues that uh, users bring back. Uh, you can manage your uh, uh, Kanban boards, you can uh, define sprints and stuff like that. But bottom line, the important stuff is that you can build uh, uh, stuff from here. And so basically uh, what I did here, for example, the database creation build is populating development objects into the database straight out of your Git repository. So if I go into the configuration mode, I can see that I set up uh, in my steps, build steps, I set up an SQL connection, and here I specify the database connection credentials, and I specify that I want to do the create schema uh, script. Uh, that is part of my Git repository. So that will actually be triggered when I change this script. This pipeline will be triggered and an updated version of that environment will be made available in my database. So that's the first step. Um, in the lab, we will actually, in a manual way, use Terraform uh, to um, oh, and go to Git, use Terraform to spin up the Kubernetes environment because, well, from a didactical purpose, I think it's better to do it that way. So if we go to the Terraform, you will see there's a bunch of uh, Terraform scripts, and the most important one is this Kubernetes one where you see that I specify that I want to have a, a container engine cluster. Uh, I give it a name, uh, I specify some networks, and I uh, want to have a node pool. So these are typically the elements that you need to provide on the level of Terraform to spin up a Kubernetes cluster. So once you've got this, uh, and there's examples available, you can very easily with Terraform spin up uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So you don't need to go through the GUI anymore, it will be done in an automated way. Once your Kubernetes cluster is up and running, you can then use the build pipelines to, for example, build a container. And let me go in this pipeline. Build containers is my build pipeline. Uh, and let me show you the type of steps that are in that pipeline. So basically here you have, you can, you can run any uh, Unix script. I need to do something with uh, uh, some library that I have to download from a machine. I can do a Docker login. I do my Docker command uh, using the standard, uh, using a specific, in this case the, the Docker file uh, with this name, and then I do a Docker push to my private uh, registry. And once that step has been executed, the Docker container will be in my repository uh, on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the uh, here on my cloud. So this is my Kubernetes cluster where I will deploy it. If I go here, I can go into my registry, and this is where I can see all the images that have been deployed, and I can who did what at what point in time. Uh, I'm just clicking on a few of them, but you can see uh, what happened. Uh, my colleague Alam uh, was playing around with a web project image uh, four days ago, for example, right? So if you run this script, this will like this pipeline, this will actually deploy your container into that environment. Now, let me go back. The other one that's interesting to look at is the actual deployment of the uh, on the Kubernetes cluster, if I go to my deploy, and I think this is my latest version, this uh, basically is the script that allows to deploy my uh, configuration to my Kubernetes cluster. And again, if I go to my build steps, I can see what I'm doing. Again, I'm doing a Docker login, and I'm doing uh, some, uh, I'm running a shell script that will actually run my Kubernetes uh, setup for me. So uh, if I go to my Git repository, I can actually visualize what exactly I'm doing there. There's my, uh, I think, which one I'm using? I think this is my YAML file. Uh, uh, defining my application called ATP3, 
uh, uh, defining the port that it will listen on. This is vanilla uh, Kubernetes configuration, right? So it's all part of uh, my Git repository. If I change something here, uh, depending on the setup that I did for my build pipelines, it will deploy to that environment. And so with that, I think I've showed you the highlights. Uh, in just one hour, I had to go real fast, and now we need to have uh, some time for questions. So uh, uh, let's go there. Yeah, if you open uh, your uh, your chat, uh, you have uh, a couple of questions that uh, I I share it. Yes. I select. Let me let me try to do that. My interface on this platform is a little bit slow to respond. Let me see. I click on chat and nothing is happening. Maybe you can read them, uh, Ettore. I think that's going to be simpler if you read the question. I, can uh, I bring my own DevOps software like Jenkins for doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, and deploy apps to Oracle, Kubernetes, and Gene? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. So we do have this developer environment that does potentially a lot of the work for you, but it is at no, in no way uh, mandatory or, uh, or, or uh, it is just the option to use. If you want to use your own pipelines, as I said, we have all the uh, interfaces to interact uh, with that environment. Uh, it's a vanilla Kubernetes cluster, so you can deploy with it. You can run your uh, scripts on a compute instance, for example. You can run your CI CD environment on a compute instance on, on the cloud. You can run it at, on, on your premises. Uh, the only thing you need to have is connectivity to the right environment where you uh, spun up that uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, obviously, depending on the security settings, you might have to be on uh, your intranet. If you have a private network that's only accessible through VPN from your corporate environment, then you can't do that from the outside. But that is normal security uh, stuff. Uh, which you need to take care of, I would say. Ettore, any other questions? Another one is, is Oracle Kubernetes Services uh, CNCF compliant? Yes, absolutely. We uh, are a member, uh, uh, I think a platinum member of the CNCF, and we uh, only use vanilla versions uh, from CNCF. And we are, uh, uh, well, I know there's some certifications and stuff, and, and yes, we are. Okay, then there is this one. Do you have a blueprint to migrate application to Oracle Cloud? For example, say a Java application using SBN, JDeveloper, WebLogic, Oracle DB. Uh, we do have, yes, we do have, as I mentioned uh, very briefly, we do have uh, tooling to automate that migration. Now, it all depends on the type of deployment that you will want to do. Uh, there's a number of options that you have in terms of how, are, how far are you gonna go. You can run WebLogic as a VM on top of our cloud, which is the basic option, which is the closest to what you would have on-premise, or you can run it as a Docker image. And in that case, you have a number of options. For example, you can package your application inside of the container, in which case you have a full CI/CD cycle uh, where you deploy every time you make a change to your application, you deploy, you redeploy your full uh, WebLogic uh, new a new uh, WebLogic container with on top of that your application, or you can choose to use um, uh, persistent volumes whereby you build your application, sorry, your WebLogic uh, container that is then deployed on the Kubernetes platform, and then you use uh, persistent volumes to do a more traditional way of uh, uh, updating your applications that are deployed on that uh, virtual volume that the web project can access from uh, the container. Okay, there is also the, this this one I think is interesting. What uh, if I need to work in a multi-cloud environment? Yes, so um, we have a number of options uh, for that. Uh, I think the most uh, talked about is the connection with Microsoft. So we have a, a direct connection with, uh, what's the name, uh, Fast Connect uh, with Microsoft, which with Azure Cloud, which allows you to really have a very easy and jointly managed uh, on the level of security and uh, identity management, et cetera, between the two clouds to have hybrid deployments uh, in that way. 
The other uh, way to look at it is obviously, well, you can run a, a Kubernetes cluster in the Oracle cloud, you can run a Kubernetes cluster in, Oracle, in, in other clouds. Um, with the Verrazano tooling that will come out, that will cover exactly that uh, use case whereby you want to deploy different applications on multiple clouds. And specifically for WebLogic, for I would say traditional Oracle stack uh, applications, WebLogic is very much cert, uh, uh, um, the, uh, meant to run on any environment. We have some specific uh, things that we will offer on uh, the Oracle cloud that you will get nowhere else. But from a technical perspective, it can run uh, anywhere. I think the big differentiator is the billing mechanism, basically. If you run on the Oracle cloud, you can go for uh, what we call uh, pay as you go. Uh, so only pay for what you use. So you don't have to buy a license uh, for a CPU that you're using, like in a traditional environment, but you will consume uh, the WebLogic license and the database license for, for that as a on a per, CPU, per OCPU per hour basis. So that means you can spin up a whole environment with hundreds of CPUs uh, for just one hour to do a load test, spin it down again, and pay well, a very small amount because it's just one hour, right? We're talking uh, behind the comma number of uh, dollars uh, for these types of uh, uh, pricing. Uh, a CPU is 0 0.06 uh, list price, and a database, uh, uh, I don't know by heart, but the web logic is 0 0.3 uh, dollars per hour. So even 100 web logics for an hour is uh, uh, 30 dollars. Yeah, correct. Yes. So very flexible way of deploying. But as I said, uh, a lot of this stuff is absolutely industry uh, or open source, industry standard, and very easy to use across clouds uh, if that is uh, uh, your in, uh, if that is what you want to do. Okay. Are there any other questions? I think that we are on top of the hour, Jan. So uh, maybe we, we will go uh, through the other question directly to the audience and the people that participate. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, just to close, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Jan. OK, thanks a lot. So I hope this was useful. Please check it out uh, on our website. Uh, go to the cloud test drive uh, if you want to play around with this uh, environment and uh, with that have a nice uh, rest of the day